This is the sixth day of this June 1984 seven-day retreat. Before we get to a koan, if we do get to it, let us discuss something that was brought up this morning by someone in a meeting. Who came in from the cold, cold of the waiting line. And asked something like this. Actually first, I think he asked, what is cold? Don't remember it correctly, but as we discuss it, maybe it will become meaningful if we all work with this, not just listen to it in terms of the ideas or words that may be used, but work inwardly with what is being said. Closely connected with this question, what is cold, was the question, what's the difference between an idea and a fact? The idea of cold and the fact of coldness is a, it's a very good question one can pose for oneself if one sits. Some people at some time in the retreat say that a real boredom sets in. What am I here for? What is there to do? <laughs> What did I come here for in the first place? This week of sunshine, wow, how, how I could have spent that someplace else. This wasn't said, but it probably goes through our heads more than once. It's a very crucial question. What is the difference between an idea and a fact? And it is very important that it be discernible by ourselves, within ourselves, what the difference is. Because if you can't tell the difference, then we're totally exploitable, subject to self-deception and deception by others. So going back to the way this started, we'll make a fresh start. I don't remember the start this morning. What is cold? What is cold? coldness without the idea of coldness? What is the idea of coldness? Maybe an example may be helpful. My own life, always having been really scared of cold water. Other people could rush into a swimming pool or into the ocean or into a lake. I had to stand there for, I don't know, sometimes it seemed hours, <laughs> inch by inch. <laughs> Each inch made it worse. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way I was and people, family, they knew it and they talked about it, so this is, was, was my way. It became a thing. 
That, that happens too if one talks too much about what a child does, tells it to the relatives or to others or discusses it, then what chance is there to step out of this? It's, there's no reason to step out of it because one is something with that, something of interest. It doesn't matter what it is, how trivial it is. <laughs> Something worth talking about or being talked about. Observe it in ourselves when it happens. We so quickly slip into something. It may be a habit, but if other people talk about it, then we like that. And we perpetuate it maybe for the sake of that. And don't look at it and drop it. So being uh, assigned in the Japanese bath schedule at the Zen Center, there was this incredible hot tub and that incredible cold tub. <laughs> For I don't know how long, I never used it because I knew I couldn't do it. linked with everything else that has been described was a, a vague fear that cold water could cause a heart attack because I could feel palpitations of the heart whenever I stepped or finally took that plunge into the water. But if you just go into a hot tub and don't go into the cold tub, the other inconveniences arise when it's sweating for the rest of the afternoon. Hot, hot flushes. So one day I decided I was going to try this thing. Come heart attack or whatever. <laughs> Feet aren't so bad up to the knees or above the knees, it's, it's not a problem. <laughs> it's the total dunking into this thing. That's the problem. And I don't know how it happened. There was no exertion of will or telling myself to do this, this was good for me. That, that wasn't there. It was just attention. Not the force of attention, but attention. And because the attention was, was there, was completely there as the submersion took place and I crouched into that whiskey tub. There was no thought of this being cold or this being dangerous, no memory, nothing. There was just that. Every once in a while a thought wanted to come up, but the attention was there and the thought disappeared again. It, it did not connect with a reaction. It didn't connect. It just came in and out. It was amazing. It was not at all what had been expected. It wasn't cold can't say what it was. You all can try it in the lake. <laughs> it was a total absence of thought and reaction to any habitual patterns. 
that still existed there in the brain, but were not triggered because there was attention. So what's the difference between the actuality of cold and the idea of cold? Maybe it's already quite clear from what has been said and looked into by each one of us. Idea is a thought process which connects with memory all the way back to one's early childhood and connects with all the sensations, experiences that have been had, that have left residue in the mind, are experienceable again, almost as though they were real, but they're just memories connecting with emotions. And reaction against or for, fright, wanting to to brace oneself. This is another thing which was absent and which was realized that the bracing against this whole thing, the, the resistance against it was the problem, not the cold. A pounding heart is what it is. There's no fear of its leading to a heart attack. It's just what it is, and it isn't what one thinks it is. It's not the idea of it. It is the, the actuality of it. Unconnected with any fright or escape or projection into the future. Attention short-circuits all of that. This person this morning continued and said, but what if an idea is seen? Isn't it then just as any other thing? An idea comes up in the mind, there's already energy is already gathered in attention. But an idea comes up, ideas do come up. It is seen. It is noticed, it is detected. Either it's already started to cause a reaction or hasn't, hasn't happened yet. The idea comes up. If it's seen, the person asks, is it any different from a sound, sound of the dog barking? Is it? It's really seen and doesn't start operating in memory, in association, in emotions, in projections. If it does that, clearly, that's what an idea, what the consequences of one idea is. And that's different from just cold or just, whoa, whoa, whoa. So one must look very carefully when a dog is barking. The word dog comes up. The person asks it, if I remember right, isn't that just the same? What, what, it's just that. Is it? Uh, uh, not assert anything or want someone else to answer it for one because at that moment the intellect is listening, very likely. They can also be listening on a deeper level of looking. But there may just be the intellect listening and 
the thing being an intellectual reception and storing and associating and answering. I'm not saying this, this was the case this morning. So the word dog comes up. Is there already awareness that a word has come up that something, a sensation has been named? Or a sound has been named. If the sound is there and the attention is with the sound, then, all oh, right, dog, and one puts it aside. That does not disturb the listening. There being just that, whether the word dog comes up or not, is rather innocuous. But very often it doesn't happen this way. The word dog comes up and connects immediately with memory of dogs. My dog at home, I wonder how he's doing. Whether the neighbors are taking good care of him. Will he still like me when I come home after seven days? Or things like this. And obviously at that moment the bark is such, just sort of a background noise, if heard at all. And this is what is called separation. It is separation. One is not with what is actually taking place. One is separated in or, or contained in this project, projection chamber of one's own thoughts and memories. <coughs> you may say, well, isn't that also an actuality? Right now there is this going on, caughtness in thought. It's actually going on as one is caught up in thoughts. It's a very, very small, narrow enclosure cut off from the vastness of reality. And also, if one is caught up in it, there's no awareness of, of the fact that one is caught up in it. The awareness dawns of what is what is happening, then there may be an opening, which is usually immediately filled with, oh, I still have thoughts. So many people say that who come into meeting. I still have thoughts, concepts, and what is Usually question is that word still. What does it mean? What is implied when we say that? Look at it. There are not only the thoughts one is caught up in, but the thought that this should not take place anymore on a fifth day, second day, seventh day of retreat, or after having attended, five, ten, fifty retreats. It is an evaluation, an evaluation is in there, judgment, standards, all separating one from the, the simple fact that there are thoughts at this instant. Why can't we live simply without conflict with what is happening? and start from what is happening and not start with the ideal situation which should be here now. After all, I've worked so long, so hard. This is all separation and frustration, misery and sorrow, depression, you, you name it. And it's so, so difficult to detect this because we've been brought up since we were born with what we should be like. Rather than a 
constantly renewed opening to what we actually are like and what our parents and teachers actually are like, like us. In our fears, aspirations, hopes, anger, jealousy, wanting love, and most of the time so dried up, so unable to let it come forth, to allow it to bubble up. So just as subtle as these separations are from our actual state this instant, the naming of it, of it already being a separation, the word cold is a separation from the actual sensation and physical feeling of this. <sighs> naming is already a separation. Can you see that? Actually, when you look. And on the heels of the name, if not already in it, is the judgment, the condemnation, or the praise. And with that, the maintenance of the self-image as being this or that, and the clinging to that self-image. So, but we started this way. As subtle as separation can be, one may not realize it, one may think one is really with it, and it needs just as subtle an awareness to detect separation as subtle as the separation is. Fine, still intense, probing, not knowing, open and vulnerable, vulnerable to what may be found and feeling it instead of bracing or stealing against it. Another question that came up was, what is the meaning of life? Said by somebody who felt that there was really a flow at times, a very joyous flow and non-separation. And then a lull, a dull lull. <laughs> and then the question, what, what, what's the meaning of all, what is really the meaning of life? 
Or as some people ask, what's the meaning of this retreat? Why do I come here? Why do I do this? Which happens in a, a dull lull. <laughs> First of all, again, before we come to the question, let's look at this lull that happens. For some reason, the, the flow, the feeling of wholeness, non-separation, and with that the, the beauty of everything, whether it's the breeze hitting the face or the sparkling of the lake, the leaves, the clarity of the air, blueness of the sky, you name it. Don't name it. <laughs> With the naming comes the law already. The separation. The brain wants to represent to itself what it is experiencing. To make something out of it. It's habitual, it's its function. Which may be all right for survival. But here it immediately starts the, the separation. One wants to, to put on a picture so that one can know it, keep it, treasure it in memory. These are not all intentions, but the brain does that if there is an instant of inattentiveness. And then, in looking again, because of all of this going on, it is not as sparkling, as bright. There's some, some membrane, as some people put it, there's a membrane there. Or a feeling of increasing dullness. One wonders why, or where does this come from? Why does it have to happen? rather than just staying right with it and letting it show itself for what it is. It may be just all of these activities of the brain, the thinking about it, the putting into words, the making a memory of it, wanting to, to have it again, grasping for it again, reaching out for it, and in the very reaching and thinking about it, creating the dullness and not being able to reach it. That moment of clarity. So then, <clears throat> thinking may be going into a different channel, into the channel in which we enjoy philosophizing about life. <clears throat> At that moment, there is still the pain of loss of that, of that wholeness. It's a real pain when one, if one remembers something and doesn't have it. Nostalgia, a physical pain and sadness. And then comes the thought, well, what's the meaning of all this life if, if one instant of joy just leads to sadness and dullness again? Can one make each happening of the body-mind something to look at with interest, with curiosity. Where does the question, what's the meaning of life, come from? Well, one sees it comes from thinking and from all that has already been described. A state of discontent, lack. and then wanting this life to have a meaning, 
which we can grasp and grab onto, live for. <clears throat> if this tremendous urge to, f to, to get an answer to this question, what's the meaning of life? If, if this urge is very strong, we may go to people who tell us what the meaning of life is and become attached to them. Because we can fill this gap at least with words. Or will one leave this question sit there and do its own thing? Again, there's a memory from personal life of having asked that question. almost constantly, during youth, during the war years, years of bombs falling, losing friends, relatives, total insanity of life that one was participating in, part of, that surrounded one, and total hopelessness of it. futility and absurdity, insanity of it. And this question of what is the meaning of life? Asked very pessimistically. Pain. Fearful, frightened. often discouraged. And yet, for some reason, that question hung in there. And asking people, there was never any satisfactory answer to it, because it didn't alleviate the sadness, the sorrow, despair, or fear. No verbal answers do. We ask about what the meaning of life is, but how do we live? Do we know what life is? Can we know what life is? Do we actually live it? Do we actually live, not just in ideas, but fully, deeply aware, not without pain, but in touch with it, without resistance or division? And sensitive to the things and people around us. Without constantly referring everything to oneself, which makes it so dull. If there can be this, this depth of living in, in, in sensitivity, in touch with what is going on, not just in oneself, but in everyone. This, this relatedness of all of us, to all of us, and to all things of this earth and sky and water, which comes with, I don't know with what, Maybe it comes out of questioning, attending, listening, being, not knowing, no conclusions, always a fresh approach. Then there is discovery almost at every moment of something. 
something clarifies, something is revealed, and there is closeness with everyone and everything. And the question, what is the meaning of life, seems so utterly meaningless. Because it's a question that always seems to ask for something beyond life itself. As though life was just there to point toward something beyond itself. Which is speculation. Hope, which comes out of the shallowness of our life. The feeling of insufficiency. And this habit of filling the insufficiency with superficial things that do not suffice, that do not satisfy. But living deeply, not in everlasting bliss or joy, but in what is, and in that with everyone, because one shares this life with everyone and everything, that question is irrelevant. It is an escape into speculation. And with that, separation. So what, what is one doing here, on the mat or walking, sitting somewhere in the woods or in the hall? What, was, what is one doing from moment to moment? is questioning what am I or who am I or what is this or just mu is it an idea is the question a thought obviously the word comes from memory. Without memory we wouldn't remember that question. It would be wiped out. But is it an idea, meaning connected with a goal, the goal of getting through, getting something, getting away from what is? Or is it an expression uttered in stillness, a stillness of no expectation, not knowing, and yet being with whatever there is wordlessly. The fears, anxieties, the anger or boredom all. Who? Or what? Omu? Not using mu or who to shove it under the rug, what is unpleasant, which happens. People detect it in themselves, they notice they've been doing it. But let that stuff be. It's there, like the wind and the birds and the tractor. Mu is no controller. It doesn't have a direction. It doesn't have an aim. Mu or what or who is a, a totally open 
unconditional question. Meaning, I don't know. If I don't know, how can I have a conclusion about anything? What comes up habitually, if it comes up unawares, it has us by the noose. If there is awareness, is the next habit condemnation and judgment? Or can mu or who or what be right there in this interval of thoughts which happens all the time? Why do we fill it with judgments and, and condemnation, comparisons to former states, or standards of what we wish we were? We do that. Do you see that? And that this is separation, which comes out of memory knowledge, such a limited field even in the brain, such a limited part even of the brain. Because there's much more to the brain than this small interpretive, recognizing segment. Brain in this work works and functions at its, at its best when it is quiet, and awake. That's all. Not offer all its programs, all its stored files. Information is not needed. It's a hindrance. What is needed is this quietness in which one can question into not knowing. And let the scariness that comes up with not knowing, knowing, be there, not knowing what it is, just as one doesn't know what the cold is. One is that. In the who or mu or what. Or just questioning without a word. Or simple attention. which wants nothing beyond itself.
We will stop here for today.